Good morning, everyone. I am Wai Cheng Sun, Associate Professor of Columbia University at New York. Today, I'm going to present my work on the granular assemble from discrete element and beyond. We will talk a little bit about the basics of the discrete element, but I would also focus a lot on the modeling, a particular in terms of multi-scale homogenization technique that are applied to granular material. And I will finish the first part of this talk with some discussions on how to moving from a DM framework to a framework that model the granular assemble with deformable particle. Before I get into the details, I would like to acknowledge my collaborator, Chan Chi, Kun, and Yang for their contribution to this work. The first questions we would like to explore together is what is the script element method? The script element method, sometimes also called distinct element method, is a technique used to model particle movement by considering individual part particle as a material that can have contact and have an overlapping. Okay. So when the material have overlap, the overlap generally generalize uh, a force, as we can see here. The tan tangential force is actually trigger. The tangential force and the normal force here is actually triggered by the amount of overlap both in the uh, vertical, uh, uh, in the normal directions and in the tangential directions. And if you allow the particle to actually overlap to each other and create a force, we then use a contact algorithm to allow us to detect the individual contact of the particle. And from that, we can create a network of force. Okay, this network of force is actually put in it in as an internal force. And then we just solving it like any other numerical methods, we will use the balance law uh, to actually allow us to solve the problem. And in the general case of the discrete element model, the balance principle is actually solved in an explicit scheme that actually consider the u double dot at m plus one, and then all the other terms are actually putting into the right-hand side. The same thing for the balance of moment. So, um, and then in the individual particle, we can also homogenizing the effect of the force to obtain the, the stress from the material. For example, for the material that are actually uh, in contact, the particle in between two particles, there would be a normal force that are acting on the two particle. And this contact force is the FG contact in this figure. And then we also have the bench rector that tell us uh, the, the locations of the uh, force contact, okay? If you actually compute the tensor product of this uh, for all the contact and then, and then add it together for all the particle contact GC, we will actually get the the total stress times the volume. And if you take out the volume, divide it, the whole thing by the volume, we will get the contact force. Uh, an interesting aspect of that homogenization is that um, the tensor products of F, I, L, J is not necessarily symmetric, but the Cauchy stress is actually symmetric. So sometime in order to actually make the calculations simpler, uh, people may apply the symmetric operator to it. And there are also other definitions of stress. But here we will stick to the classical definitions where the stress, the Cauchy stress is assumed to be approximately equal to the volume average of the tensor product between the bench rector and the force rector. Okay, another type of the contact or, or interactive force doesn't require the particle to be in contact. And this could be the force that are due to the water. For example, liquid bridge that may exist between two particles when there is enough water 
and the air pressure to lead to that uh, that pendulous shake of water. Okay, this force can be solved by the Young Laplace equations, and by solving the Young Laplace equations, we can also get the force that the from com coming from the capillary. If you look at it, we can also homogenizing it using the same expressions. Then the total stress of the material would be actually equal to the contact force from the solid skeleton that are in contact plus the force uh, for plus the plus the stress that are actually coming from the capillaries uh, pressure and also the <clears throat> also the air pressure. An interesting thing to notice is that if you look at it closely because individual particles can have liquid bridge connect in different way the capillary uh, stress is actually not necessarily isotropic, but they actually maybe evolve to have the shear strain. From the microscopic perspective, that explains why when we have the when we have the dry water when we have the dry granular material, oftentimes the stress strain curve starts from from the from the, your your U surface of your failure surface may start at the original point in the QP space, but with with increasing degree of saturations, you may actually have a apparent cohesion. That cohesion uh, is actually coming from the degree of uh, is actually coming from the water inside. But if you increase too much water, and then the water coming out from the pendulary regions. Eventually, too much water will actually losing that um, that cohesive force. So this may increase initially when the degree of saturation is increased. But when you increase beyond the pendulary regions, and then and then when the liquid bit forming the patch, um, the the amount of uh, cohesions may change. And eventually, when we have too much water, and it go back into the non cohesive behavior. Okay, so this group element actually provide us a tools to model the detailed granular mechanics in great details. However, there are a few things that uh, to be noticed. In individual particle, we never have the force field and the degree of freedom is actually assigned at the center, meaning that the degree of, your degree of freedom basically is capturing how the centroid of the individual particle move. And your kinetic information is actually stored in the contact, which means the force vector at the moment are within a single contact. Okay, so later on, this limitation will be discussed, and then we would actually talk about a way to resolving that. One major difficulty of this, uh, the discrete element modeling, is when we're trying to model fracture or damage with individual particle. In fracture mechanics, your stress is actually your the whether the crack propagate is due to the is due to whether the stress intensity factor which is reaching a critical value or whether you have enough energy that allow crack to actually create. In order to do that, we need to cut, we need to have the stress field, and this stress field would be missing. The consequence is the following: if we were upon con pawn wise contact. No matter how small the force it is, the contact, um, the stress will be infinite because the area is actually zero or approaching zero. Okay. However, if you have a contact that actually have a very large contact area with the same amount of force, the stress is profoundly less. Okay, with the D discrete element model, that is actually good to actually model the material that are nearly undeformed. But for the material that may, or the material that doesn't have damage, but for the material that involve path dependent behavior and, 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 or the detailed kinematic between the, the particle are very important, uh, the discrete element model requires some modifications. So this is actually some of the simulations that uh, you can actually easily generate. And this is actually the result of a pain string by axial compaction test. Uh, 
uh, in a typical simulations, what we want to observe is that uh, is actually not only the the particle uh, movement or the microscopic strength here, you can clearly see the strength are increasing. But what the DEM model afford you is the ability to see the revolutions of the particle contact evolving. Okay, in this case, we see something kind of artificial because the simulation is conducted in a periodic boundary. And as a result, when the shear bank is formed, you see this shear bank, they are forming it in a periodic manner. Okay, but one thing still what we can observe is that when the shear bank is formed, the rotation is actually concentrated in the shear bank. And what is actually distinctly different between discrete modeling and the contagium or missile scale modeling is that you can get a lot of geometrical or topological information around the grand particle and then using it to analyze the underlying mechanism of the of the of the emergent feature like shear bending. And this is actually not something easy to easily done with a contagium modeling. Okay, so another thing that uh, you can see is that the discrete element simulation with the same assemble can obviously have a very different uh, response and show here is actually two type of response. And what we actually have is the same constituted model with a different details uh, constituted law. If you just have a normal uh, degree of freedom with a traction separation law uh, with a uh, we have a classical tangential uh, law that are limited by the Mach Coulomb fairly envelope for each contact. We would actually see the red curve. Okay, if we increase the rolling degree of freedom and the sliding degree of freedom, we we it seems that uh, for the dense assemble, we incur encouraging the softening behavior, as you can see here. So one of the major, and then you can see the same thing for the plastic bilatency. So here, um, the negative is a compressive side and the positive is actually the tangential size. You can see that initially, the volume, the volume of the DM assemble is actually reducing and then up to the point where, where we observe the peak then the then the phase trans transitions occur, and then we have the plastic dilatancy that driving the show for the increasing of the of the volume expansion. Okay, so and the nice thing about this uh, with the DM is that you can see the uh, you can see the revolutions uh, in the DM microstructure. Okay, and if you study the undergraduate soil mechanics course, you probably see that. If I have very dense pack, okay, and then I apply the shear, what actually happened is that the shear it, for a dense pack, it turned to open up the space. Okay, so, so here, um, but if I introduce the shear, the, the face actually open up and then hence we can see the, the volume actually getting increased. And but the open up of the void space also probably explain the the drop in the softening, and that one profiling effect is that usually this open up of the void space are related to the grand rotations, and you can see that from the DM, or you can see it from the previous assemble uh, simulation where you can see at the shear bank the the rotation is actually much more profound. Okay. So this is one example of using the DM to model the, the granular material. You can get into the details, but keep in mind that there are few things that you cannot model. For example, if you have a very compact shape, and then the gran are actually in a perfect contact that are actually resemble a hertzian, then the results of the, of, then the consequence is that you may capture some of the revolutions of the topology, but that topology revolution may not be exactly realistic. Okay, so now we talk about the DEM. The next topic I would like to talk about is that how do we preserve the length scale 
for the multi-scale DEM FEM simulations. Okay, so we talk a, a lot about the advantage of using the DEM, but one thing that are actually quite well known in the, at least in the geotechnical engineering community, is that it's really hard to create a sample that resemble a particular specimen of soil, for example, Norwegian sand or Houston sands. Okay, those are very difficult tasks to do. And in this part, the classical consultative model may provide a better job. But in general, one another major reason is that the DM application could be sometimes limited is also the, the restriction on the scale. In the DM simulations, you model individual particle. Okay, but what if you want to model a uh, spatial domain data in kilometer scale? or even just in meter scale. Okay, how many particles do you have would actually lead to how many, would actually linearly relate to how much degree of uh, freedom you have. And then it quickly go over the computer limit. There are way to actually improving the DEM simulations, but uh, for the very large scale modeling individual particle is not realistic, even with the computational power because it's also incredibly hard to calibrate the model that are inherently heterogeneous in the small scale. Another question that we would like to explore, and this is actually relatively new, is that how do we actually simulate the, the discrete element or discrete nature of the particle when it's underwater? Or actually find a way to incorporate the water, the descent of the water effect on the granular assemble. A possible way to tackle this problem is to simulate it uh, in uh, RVE and then using the RVE to replace the constitutive law. In the final element, individual integration point gives us the force and uh, give us the stress and in return give us the force. So if we write a final element for solid mechanics, we actually try to solve the divergence of the uh, Cauchy stress plus the body force equal to zero, okay, in point wise. <clears throat> and that stress can be coming from a uh, constituted law, but here we replace the constituted law with a DEM and we can simulate the material property and we can provide an incremental stress update for each increment by having a final element. And in each time step, we actually update the U. And from the displacement field, we can actually compute the string, okay, from by definitions. And this string is then converged into a boundary conditions on the RVE assemble, for example, if I if my displacement is actually like this for a one atom particle, then I will impose a shear into that DEM. And then that DEM would actually update the force chain and then the force chain, and then we will get a new force after we solving the underlying DEM problem. And then the force can put it back into the, the force chain and then the update of the bench vector can give us a new stress and then we can actually provide an update of the final element on the next time step where we have a new in external force and then we can actually go over the loop and then and then replacing the constituted law. There are multiple efforts uh, in doing that. Uh, here what we're trying to do is to expanding that into the into the um, into the pole mechanics problem, where there is a water that I react with the react with the solid. We do this actually because in most of the geotechnical engineering problem, we need to do with consolidations that involve water. And uh, the DEM that we are using is uh, actually the Yadi DEM. If you Google Yadi, you can actually find a very comprehensive documentations, including a basic tutorial. And they also have the engine that allow you to directly run a traxial compaction test or simple shear test. I will encourage all the participants to actually take a look at the code.
again, I'm not directly involved in the project, but I just found that this is actually a useful tool, and I would like to share that uh, that user experience with the community. Okay, so a little bit of review of the of the calculations in the large step formations uh, regimes. Okay, in the large step, step formation regimes, uh, and then again we will follow the solid trajectory. Okay, so the interesting thing about the consolidation problem is that we have the balance of linear momentums. Okay, and then we also have the balance of mass, but in the in this case. One thing that are very interesting in the DEM, FEM uh, homogenization calculation is that not only does the stress is coming from the DEM, okay, the Bill's coefficients, which actually have the definitions of one minor k divided by ks, can also coming from the DEM calculations, okay, because we can actually predict the volumetric expansions and then get the update uh, k tangents as we try to compress the material. So that B is actually compute from a DEM assemble. <clears throat> Another thing that worth to notice is that um, we can actually <clears throat> also update the M and M is called the Bill's coefficients, which is also a function of Ks kf but also k and also the Bill's coefficients okay finally in the dm simulations even if we don't run the letter boseman in each time step we actually can update the dm assemble as you can see here as i deform the material i would actually get a new configurations of the particle and then that configuration particle can allow us to also update the new k Okay, that can be done in multiple ways. One way is to use the network model because we know where is the grain is. And if the grain is in the spherical shape, we can easily find the void space. And then the void space can actually create a flow network that allow us to quickly update K. Okay, so K is coming from the DM assemble. M is coming from the DM assemble. B is coming from the uh, uh, from the discrete element assemble, but also the effective stress is coming from the DM assemble. In in particular, coming from the bench vector and the uh, and the uh, and the void ratio. Uh, sorry, and the uh, and the bench vector. Okay, <clears throat> and here we would have, assuming that the effective principle is actually valid. And so that we can actually partition the total stress. This is actually the second critical stress into the effective stress, uh, effective second critical stress, and also the pushback of the uh, stress. Okay, uh, of coming from the water, post, uh, coming from the pole water pressure. Okay, so here I'm just uh, showing some of the examples. So we are directly use uh, what Professor Tasaki is actually uh, uh, postulate in the, as the effective stress principle. All the change of the stress are actually such as compaction, distortions, and change of the shear res re resistance are exclusively to change in effective stress. Okay, so your solid skeleton movement or actually the def more accurate, the solid skeleton deformation are exclusively attributed to the effective stress. And everything else you, uh, is actually coming from the pore water for the fully saturated material. Okay, so here is one example. Okay, so again, the K is the bug modulus, uh, the tan tangential bug modulus of the material. As I'm deforming the material, I can see that the Bill's coefficients may change and that my Bill modulus may change, not in a small amount, okay, while my permeability is also changed according to the network model, okay. So this gives us a very comprehensive uh, treatment on the consolidated model because all the consolidated model whether is a solid consolidated law or the hydraulic law are all coming from are all coming from the same REE, okay? The issues 
in the classical consultative modeling is that sometimes you have to deduct the hydraulic, uh, hydraulic, uh, consultative relationships or actually identify the parameter coming from a completely different, uh, microstructure. And that may lead to some inconsistence because if you shear the material and measure the permeability in the, in a particular material state, it may be different than the, than the other material that has the same porosity, but in a different material state. Like when it's subject to a significant amount of shear or torsions, the permeability may also change as a result of the shear. But in most of the constitutive law, the most is, is at least the most commonly used one. The permeability is often only used uh, related to the porosity. So these DM simulations provide us a very convenient, convenient way to actually have a uniform treatment on all the constituted law that are necessary as a supplement to the balance principle to allow us to solve the governing equations. So we published a paper in 2016 on the details of the algorithm. I don't want to talk too much about the details here, but we also use a semi implicit explicit algorithm track that make the prediction easier in the sense that we treat the elastoplastic operator in the explicit manner, but then we keep the elastic portions of the material uh, behavior in the elastic uh, in the implicit manner, and we never update this. So that gives us a more stable simulations as we actually try to get the update. Okay, so again, here we split the internal force into explicit and explicit part. The reason is actually that then we don't have to deal with uh, inverse problem or perturbations to get the KEP. There are, however, another possible solutions of obtaining the KEP from simple consultative law, but in a generic approach that Sometimes the consultative law may also introduce a risk, viscosity and other, other thing. Then an algo solution may not be so easy to, uh, to, to derive. And then this could be obtained by finite difference. However, that could be very time consuming. So here for convenience, we just put it in the explicit part. Now with the in internal force speed that are actually coming from the, from the stress, of the DEM, okay, or the direction of the stress of the DEM, we split it into the implicit part. And what precisely happening is that we assume there is a elastic contributions that are actually um, constant, and we don't update it. And then we also uh, actually based on that elastic calculations, we can also compute. Uh, we can also compute the plastic distribution uh, contributions of the internal force. And then we also, for convenience, put all the coupling all and the coupling of diagonal term uh, in pieces. Okay, so now with this, then the geometrical long uh, stiffness term and then the DM homogenization elastoplastic contribution are treated explicitly. And when the two things combine, uh, we can actually easily compute the, the force without. Uh, uh, considering uh, updating the tangents. Okay, so here is the details on how to compute the stress. Okay, in order to compute the stress, what we actually need to do is actually uh, have a summation of all the force and the bench vector. The issue is that we also need to choose a particular size so that it can fulfill the hill Mandel lemma, lemma for the butt modulus and also for the interface. So uh, for the butt material for the solid mechanics problem, you want thing that the the scalar product between the the effective stress tensor and the uh, and the strain ratio uh, and the strain weight is actually um is actually equals to the to the volume average of the whole uh, uh, of the scalar product. Okay, so what it means is that if I have a sample and then I calculate the average s uh, average um, average stress and the average strain. Okay, 
So that bracket is mean volume average. And I put a dot there. It will be the same as, so it will be the same as I basically compute the average of the scalar product. And this could generate the right boundary condition for you to solve the problem. The same thing, the same philosophy can be put into the, to the Darcy's flow where we want thing that if you, if you averaging the passive gradient and measure the Q, it will be the same as measuring that dog product. Okay, so you can also put a one half there. So, okay. Okay, so the, the same philosophy can be applied on an interface with a finite thickness. And then this would give us the, the rules for the homogenizations for the traction separation law. So, um, okay. So this, pay, this homogenization strategy has be review a number of time in this paper. If if you're interested, uh, please feel free to take a look. One thing that uh, actually also important is to notice that the size of the DM actually matter, both in terms of generating the predictions that actually fulfill the human lemma for uh, proper computer homogenizations, but also for generate isotropic uh, Isotropic granular assemble. Okay, not every time do we want to generate uh, isotropic assemble because sometimes we, we are purposely trying to study the anisotropy and isotropy of the material. But in general, when we actually try to study the material uh, or the constitutive response in the QP space, we don't necessarily want to create an isotropy because it, the anisotropy meaning that in the piping, you may have other compact shape that doesn't actually make it feasible to study the constitutive response in the QP pine space. Okay, so one thing that uh, you can notice and you can also easily generate the numerical test in um, in Yadi is that when you increase or assemble into uh, when you decrease the amount of the particle in the assembled state is harder and harder to get an initial uh, isotropic res uh, response. If you purposely try to introduce an isotropic response, what we need to do is to first have the similar shape of the particle, and then we need to actually have sufficient particle to make the response to be isotropic. Uh, another effect is also coming from the hill mandals effect, uh, and you may, you may, and this is also important when we don't have enough particle. Okay, we can see here we do a numerical experiment from having seventy five particle to about a little bit less than one thousand particle. The more particle we have, the less scale of fluctuations you can observe, both in the shear stress case. Um, for the periodic boundary conditions and also in the displacement control boundary conditions. Another thing that you would like to see is that periodically for the same material subject to the different boundary conditions, you would be ex expect to actually receive the same constitutive response. And this is more or less true for the elastic response. But uh, at the, the peak of the shear strength of the material are actually very sensitive to the boundary condition we impose. If we impose a periodic boundary conditions, you would actually get less shear stress than we impose a displacement. And if you actually, we did not try, but if you provide attraction boundary conditions, it would also be even weaker than the periodic boundary conditions. So this discrepancy turn to suppress as we increase the bunch, the, the, the sampling size. So this is actually one of the famous figure that you can find it in a lot of textbook. As we increase the size of the sample of the RVE, okay, the scale of fluctuations may actually reduce uh, for a different boundary value problem. And also the discrepancy by solving the traction base and the displacement base problem turn to also vanish or actually at least suppress as, as we increase the number of particle. Okay. But that being said, 
if you want to get a reliable, if you want to uh, generate a reliable uh, constituted law from the REE simulations, the size of the REE need to be carefully determined to make sure that we, it makes sense to have uh, to assume this as a continuum and we suppressing the, the scale of fluctuation enough so that the results are actually stable and actually reliable. Okay. So here we did a simple test on our case. Okay, we provide actually two similar, uh, the identical simulations. Uh, they are both uh, undrained DEM. Okay, with the following uh, cash phrase. The one DEM that we have, then they are both undrained. Okay. So in the classical undrained simulations, the volumetric strength should be just a straight line. Okay, so straight line. Okay, but if the material, if the fluid, strictly speaking, is compressible, then what actually you have is that you find there's a very tiny volume strength that could going on because because the water or the liquid itself is compressible. And we want to see what is the consequence of this versus if you actually model the water inside the DEM and allow the water to move inside the specimen, okay? So on the left-hand side, these two simulations are actually imposing the volume constraint, which means that uh, in the DEM simulations, if I actually reduce the, uh, the volume, we introduce a strength, uh, let's say epsilon one here, then epsilon one is actually plus epsilon two plus epsilon three is actually equal to zero. So these two combined would compensate the volume change so that that one would have uh, no volume change. Okay, now with the compressive flow, the material can be slightly compact and the reason is the following. Uh, if you actually look at the balance of mass, the directions of velocity in the undrained condition where all the water are taking out is actually equal to one divided by mp dot equal to zero. Okay, so that M here being finite is actually what gives us the, the stress, the, the slightly uh, volume expansions that you can see in those results. Okay, and then we see something pretty interesting. And uh, not just that, we also load the shear string into the 10% regions, which is actually geometrically nonlinear. And what we can actually see here is that First of all, when we allow the water to be compressed, then the classical assumption that the volume doesn't change doesn't apply because the water is a slightly compressible, at least in the numerical simulation where there is a leakage of the water. And we can see that the shears actually change as a result, but also we can see the difference between the small and large deformation could be quite profound, okay? But then the actual interesting thing is the comparison between the left figure to the right figure, okay? Well, what we can see is, is that in both cases, the shear stress is almost identical, meaning that you know, those simulations, uh, meaning that assuming that uh, a volumetric constraint to resemble an undrained test is actually very reasonable for the stress, but the geometrical consequence on the volumetric strain is actually quite profound. Okay, in the small strain, we can still observe the dilatancy, but if we allow the water to move within the specimen, we may see a little bit of compressions. Okay, and in the in that simulations, we can see the similar train. Okay, in the undrained stress path, we prepare different assemble with different specific volume. And then this is actually coming from a DEM simulations. We can actually replicate the new sand behavior, uh, the, the medium dense sense behavior, and then the dense sense behavior that replicate the, the, the train of the real material in the loose and then in the dense state. And we can also see the uh, small change of the, of the stress as a function of the, uh, of the volume. But what we're actually seeing is that the volume constraint, if you actually resolve it into a boundary element, uh, element 
it get a very different uh, boundary conditions than the than the globally undrained uh, pole pressure. So you see the pole pressure field here. There's a neck. So the whole thing is basically identical. Even though you see a pattern, they all minor one seventy five. But if you have a globally undrained system, the corner will, will actually accumulate a lot of stress, and then that actually actually make the homogeneous. Um, and Jen stay uh, unsustainable, okay? And this is actually no matter how long you take, if, the, if you stimulate the undrained constraint, uh, that corner will remain there, that stress concentrations, when you actually allow it to be rewatered. Okay, so another type of test we can do from DEM is actually by introducing the liquid bridge model and this is actually one of the interesting results I would like to share with the audience. Okay, as we can see here, uh, we're seeing that uh, changing the degree of saturations may have an effect on the on the shear strength in the in the in the DM assemble. Okay, so here we can see the dry state is actually the one with the lowest shear strength, and then the uh, critical uh, state. Um, Q. And as we increase the degree of saturation to 3 and 7, we get a, a, more, a, a more shear. And that, this is actually not coming from any consolidated law, but simply homogenizing the response both from the contact and also from the liquid bridge. Okay. And this is actually worth mentioning because what we actually see is the water doesn't only play a role on actually affecting the material, um, affecting the material uh, property in the isotropic manner. It also in uh, changing the shear uh, strength of the material. Okay, so we can seeing that okay, well, in that simulations, when we actually form the shear bank, we see the Principles, uh, principal strain actually in the compactions, uh, and then uh, and we also see the porosity change, which means that inside the void space, the void start to get larger, and we can see the degree of saturation evolve as the liquid bridge rupture. So what happened is that we have a we have a dense assemble initially with seven percent degree of saturation, so they roughly uh at the at the pendular regions and as a dilation uh as the dilation shear bank is formed so the void space actually open up okay so when the when initially we have a liquid bridge here but now we actually increase the space then the the, the distance between the two particles the liquid bridge will rupture and then the water will be distributed and that lead to the loss of the shear uh, and then that leads to some loss of the uh, loss of the shear strength, and then that rupture we do the tensile and the shear strength, and this is actually why we see the we see the the softening and the perfect plasticity. Another thing that we can easily done in the DM, and I think this is actually quite interesting, is to study the capillary effect that are not isotropic. Okay, so in fact. If you actually consider the liquid bridge and then do the homogenization of the liquid bridge, what we found out is that so S is a suction, which is the distance, which is the difference between PA and PW, the pressure of air and the pressure of water. Okay, so this is the effective stress principle. Uh, for the for the unsaturated material, what is actually inter interesting here is that we can actually seeing the revolutions of a tensile base shift coefficients. Okay, so the base shift coefficient is not only not a scalar, but it also have history dependent behavior. They is path dependent from the DEM simulations alone. And if we are assuming that the material remain in the pendular regions, what we actually can see is that 
when we actually increasing the shear and then eventually lead to the softening and when we unload the material, the loading and unloading actually trigger a path dependent on the porosity revolutions. But also, so we also lead to the eigen values of that basic coefficient change according in a pattern that looks like the reverse of the velocity change okay so what actually showing here is that when the degree of saturations and actually evolve due to the deformations of the solid and the new equilibrium established from the young Laplace equation that governing the unsaturated material the base shift coefficients that are supposed to be a constant is also e is actually evolving and it evolved in a path dependent manner that if we actually without the dm constituted law we will need a constituted model that capture the path dependency okay so a material that a path dependency cannot write it as a function but we have to also uh, figure out the right mechanism for example figure out the right KKD conditions to actually showing that for the given amount of strength or porosity, if we actually, if we actually um, I don't know the path, we cannot determine the particular value. And that apply, of course, to the porosity. This is not surprising because we are passing the plastic dilatancy, but also on the degree of saturation, which is also not surprising. Uh, because as we change the suctions, we are expecting the degree of saturation have some path dependency. But what is actually uh, considered quite interesting and perhaps a new discovery is the fact that the base shift tensor, first of all, the, it showed that the base shift coefficient is a tensor. Because if the base shift uh, coefficient is actually a scalar, then what we would have is that the, then the eigenvalues of the base shift coefficient would be equal to each other. Here we see clearly a gap. And then the gap is actually evolving, which means that the base shift coefficients, at least at the pendular regions, is actually far now from the DM to be path dependent and also anisotropic. And from the DM, we can easily deduct the mechanism that govern the tensoral uh, base shift coefficients revolutions. And that can give us, this is an example where it gives us some inspirations on how should we write the constituted law when we try to model the unsaturated material that are primarily driven by capital V? Of course, I haven't talked about the assumptions, which is another mechanism that perhaps could be modeled by the EM, but uh, this would be out of the scope of this talk. Okay, so another thing that are very convenient in the DEM here, we just want to show some of the possible usage of the DEM is that we can also study how does the microstructure affect the, the microscopic mechanism. For example, here, I have a big grain sample, and I purposely add some small fine, okay? I want to see how does the small fine act differently than, the, than the basically just increasing the density by actually adding the big particle, okay? And what we actually found out is that when we have a liquid bridge, actually the result look more smooth with the fine particle. And also with the fine particle, the shear strength actually increased way more. Okay, so you see here, when we actually have suctions, there is some degree of saturation, so we do expect the shear stress to increase, but not by that much. This large increase in the porosity, uh, sorry, in the shear stress is mainly attributed by the fact that you think about it from the micromechanics. If I have a large particle, I need to form a large filter bridge for the for the air pressures, and then we, we stay in equilibrium. But if I have a large particle with some small particle, and then the air pressure assume is the same, I may actually able to form a lot of small liquid bridge. Okay, instead of this big one. And then the consequence of that small liquid bridge may lead to a more, uh, when we actually have the shear, it may have a more continuous response, meaning that instead of one liquid bridge suddenly get, uh, get ruptured due to the shear, 
you may get a small liquid bridge that are actually slowly and slowly fracture and then and then there could be new uh new um liquid bridge that are forming uh, if you wait long enough for the air pressure and the water to reach your equilibrium and so this is actually shown in here okay so for the same amount of the suctions you can see i think the fine particle actually make the shear stress more profound and you this could be uh something that we can learn from the dm simulation and get the inspiration for designing new material for example uh, that leveraging the unsaturated behavior to increase the shear strength another topic that are quite important for the dm fdm simulation is that um if you try to simulate the DM assemble, if you have a DM as, uh, assemble to replace the constituted law, and then if we find the, uh, uh, the, let's say the material is homogeneous, and then all the gases form have the same LVE, <clears throat> and as we try to refine the mesh, we will generate more gases form. And let's say that the gases form distance is much larger than the than the RVE, so you probably would be still doing assembling. <clears throat> and if we have a few different uh, different mesh, and then we run the DEM as a replacement for the constituted law, this is what we get. Okay, what happened is that in the elastic zone and in the hardening zone, regardless of the mesh, you doesn't get that much different results. But as you solvent the material, Okay, it show a significant mesh dependency. <clears throat> and that mesh dependency is very well known for classical constituted law. And here we just show one trick that can easily be solving this is the following. We can make a correction so that this result can lead to a mesh independent result. If you know the particular length scale of the material, let's say the material uh let's say the shear bank length scale is much larger than the particle and also the rve let's say it has a length of this and what we actually can do is using the law local <clears throat> technique to actually introduce a law local staker law local method that uh introduce a law local uh, model dependence <clears throat> on on creating a new long local string measure that not only take the load, that for each gases point, not only take the strength, but the neighborhood of different strength values. Okay, and then homogenizing it using a Bell's functions to come up with a new strength value for each gases point. <clears throat> so if we're replacing that strength, with the actual strength that are coming from the displacement with that, with that, that um, volume every string what you introduce is a size the size effect because if i change the size if i change the circle size i will collect more sample point and then i will introduce more dependency among the i will uh, uh, over a larger domain so this string can be now instead of in the classical dm simulations the string you compute from this basement is actually putting it into the dm simulations to give you the stress here, the new method introduce a new step. We have a displacement, and then from the displacement, we can compute the strength, and then we use that law local calculations to give us a law local strength, and that law local strength is actually converged into a DEM boundary conditions to give us the stress. Okay, so just this one, these two step can actually allow us to get the constituted law that are uh, that are actually overcoming. <clears throat> Um, the, the mass dependent in the sovereignty regimes. However, the drawback is the following. And I think it's actually pretty clear. If we have that many gases point and we have to assuming that the shear bank is actually larger than the element, very likely it won't be suitable for the case if your shear bank is actually in a very small regions where you only have a few particles. <clears throat> so that brings us into the new topic. In those case, we can actually have a DM FEM simulation, but we need to introduce a localization element as the shear bank is propagating. <clears throat> okay, so the insertions of the finite element, the discontinuity into the finite element can be found in a number of literature. Here, we don't want to um, 
replacing it uh, or actually uh, <clears throat> repeat it in that are available in the classical literature. What we actually want to talk about is actually the the, the new contributions that uh, that we would use the human dose equation so that when we insert when we actually introduce the interface, we will actually we will actually capture the 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 displacement jump and then displacement jump will be keep into we will, will be input into the enhanced strength and then that would actually allow us to discover not just the strength to stress but the but the underlying checksums behind that uh, strong interface that are actually obtained from the DEM. And this can be seen in these two uh, CMME paper and there are more papers that are addressing that. The same philosophy can be applied for the Darcy's law and then we can talk about it or the or for the uh, uh, fluid conductivity along the strong uh, discontinuity. Okay, so here we just we, without further delay, we will just do a very simple test. Um, and then we have the DEM assemble that put in into each gas's point, but we also add a cohesive zone element. And this is actually the material parameter. Again, we use the Yardi for the constant law, but we put this in this particular case, the constant law is putting it in the cohesive zone element, not necessarily getting the the stress from the strain measure. <clears throat> and uh, this is actually the response. Okay, we can see that the crack is opening. <clears throat> and as the crack is opening, you can actually see that the force actually go down and then it has a cosine static <clears throat> relationships. And this, in this particular constituted law, is actually not a granular material, but also have a limit cohesion that allow the the cohesion force to be break, so that the material, the over overall parameter, uh, have some tensile strength as well. Okay. And the next ex extension I would like to talk about is the small string micropolar DMFEM method. Okay, so this is also another way to consider the DM simulations, but with the screen that we are trying to homogenizing not just the strength to the stress, but also trying to introduce more information from the kinematic and the kinetic uh, relationships to help us make leveraging the expensive DEM to get more information to inform the microscopic predictions. Okay, so in a general Michael Murphy kinematic, we have the displacement and then the displacement based on, and then the, the new material point depends on the rigid body motions or and plus the uh, and uh, and also the deformation gradient times the x and the, but if you consider the Taylor expansion, it also depends on the second term, uh, the higher order term, which actually which actually tell us that uh, we also need to consider this uh, particular the, um, gradient term of the deformation gradient in order to actually map the x. Okay. One way to simplify this problem is to considering that that set is to basically ignore that second term and the third term and just consider this in our in our calculations. <clears throat> but the, but another alternative that make it easier is to consider a micromodal micropolar kinematic, which we do not consider the complete term of this, but we consider the deformation gradient is actually uh, approximately equals to the <clears throat> to the to the micro rotation term, and then that will give us this. Okay, so that will give us a kinematic. Uh, that will give us a micropolar kinematic. In which case, what we need to do in the small strain calculation is actually we would impose a strain or stress measure to, to deform it in the first order, 
kinematic, but in a high order kinematic, we have the same BM simulation, the initial configurations, but we would impose deformation gradient and then the curvature. And what we need to measure is of the homogenized stress, but also the force, the force, the something like a Cauchy stress, but it's now called the force stress, but also the couple stress that actually related to the moment derived by the area. Okay, so this is a second order deformation. In the first order, this is what we get. In the second order, we get this, but we also get the curvature term. Okay, the curvature term actually coming is actually not related to the particle rotations, but the relative rotations of the two particles. You can see here, okay, this is one orientation, this is one orientation, this is our original configurations. As we actually deform the material, uh, as we deform the material, not only does the relative positions of these particle and this, this particle and this particle are changing, but then their orientations could also change it. And that's actually give us the curvature term. Okay, so the, I just want to emphasize the difference between the classical contagion model and the micropolar. In the micropolar container mechanics model, the force vector is, uh, the force stress is non-symmetric. And how non-symmetric it is depends also on the couple stress, which actually have the unit of a moment divided by the area. And in, unlike the classical uh, contagion, where we only have one energy conjugate pair between the strain and the Cauchy stress, now we have two of them. Okay, so the, the strength, uh, the first order strength to the force vector and the curvature or the high order term related to the couple stress. Okay, so we can recap what we did, but now we actually need to using the energy conjugate pair we identify to actually create the right boundary condition for us. Again, we have the kinematic, okay. We can homogenizing the stress uh, like what we did before, okay. And now, actually, this is actually very natural for the DM. And you can see th uh, what is the benefit of the micropolar uh, formulation immediately. FL is actually non-symmetric by deformations, uh, by definitions. But here in the in the micropolar kinematic, the force stress are actually not necessarily symmetric. So we can be solve one of the paradox where if you're using these formulations to get the Cauchy stress is not symmetric. But here, because what actually you are trying to get is actually should be the false stress that are never required to be symmetric in the first place. Because if you think about the individual particle, unless you actually turn off the rotations, there are already rotations in each individual particle. So modeling it with the micropolar would inherently make more sense and actually uh, homogenize it into the classical continuum. Uh, so we can actually using the same uh, philosophy to compute the stress, to compute the couple stress. The couple stress is uh, skew symmetric, and then these equations can be found in the in the paper from with. Uh, but they and Vendelakis, and we also actually published a conference paper on detailing the band, the calculations. With that in mind, then what we actually need to do is to recover the boundary, unmissable boundary conditions that allow us to fulfill the Hume and Dow's lemma. Okay, so for the first order model, this is actually very obvious. Okay, so we, we just have the classical displacement and the traction boundary that are coming out from the human Dow's lemma. In the higher order case, we actually have two energy functional and we and if after some deviations, what we will get is actually two type of uh actually three type of, <clears throat> of the boundary condition that are missable. One is that we prescribe the displacement and then the micro rotations and then get the tractions for the force stress and the couple stress. Another one is actually the purely and the prescribe the tractions and then get back the, the strain and, uh, and also the, the curvature.
but we can also this is actually new we can also have mixed type we can prescribe the checksums uh for the for the false stress but actually prescribe the curvature okay so that gives us more flexibility and there are more discussions in these two paper okay the width form here we just do work on small deformations and then this is very classical so i won't repeat it here the only difference is that is these equations okay so in these equations we have the couple stress and then uh, we also uh, have the additional term that actually control and then the amount of the skew symmetric term uh, of the force stress is actually related to the couple stress okay and the balance of and then we are assuming that the wolf profile to be nonpolar just to make the calculation easier and that will lead to the classical balance law nothing new okay so we verified the problem and this is actually a very famous uh problem that have repeat multiple times uh and you probably see that in our undergraduate course if you apply a uh, uniform uh unilateral <coughs> extensions in the x directions and we have a hole there the stress that are at the boundary would be three times more than the p square checksums. Okay, so this is actually called the stress concentration factor, and this would be three. So if we, so stress concentration factor equals to always three for classical contained there. And this is regardless of what is A. So you have a hard, large hole and you have a small hole, you get the same stress intensity factor. Unless the domain is so small that we actually see the boundary effect. Okay, so now here what we actually try to see is that whether we can actually predict, we, we cover what uh, Stefan Cohen did. And it's actually by introducing the micropolar, what the classical result telling you is that now with the micropolar, um, uh, me mechanics model that introduce the size effect. If I introduce, the, if I actually changing the the size of the voice, I will start to actually see the stress concentration factor change according to the size of the voice. And this is actually what we're trying to do. We try to introduce the link scale parameter and see whether we can recover. Uh, we can recover the size effect, and this is our result compared with the analytical solutions. As we see before, as as we actually make the R divided by L, the radius uh, divided by the sine length larger and larger, we, we the link scale effect vanish. But when it's actually small, you can see that uh, we recover the Kc, which is the stress concentration factor in the DEM model. And the second test we did is that again, um, for simplicity, we only do the test in 2D and we run the drain by axial compaction test. Um, but uh, we actually still allow the, the pressure to be solved, um, but it's just that the pressure will be very small. Okay, so we introduce the constituted law inside and then we see what happened. Okay, and what we actually immediately see and for the dry case at least is that the DMFEM for the micropolar for the micropolar case is actually not that sensitive to the length scale. Okay, so this is a fine mesh, this is a coarse mesh. Okay, they are actually so the fine mesh are obtained from one refinement from the coarse mesh. You can see that the microscopic response is actually almost identical with a little bit of difference because of the fine mesh has a, a, a more ability to actually resolve the stress concentrations at the boundary. And we can also see the effect. Okay, as the shear bank is forming, you can, uh, uh, with a dense sample, again, you can see the Again, you can see the what you can see the volumetric expansions. Okay, just like the last time, we see a little bit of pole pressure. This is very small, and this is expect because it's actually, after all, a drain case. 
So the if you load it fast enough, it actually trigger a little bit of low low cold water redistributions. Uh, the interesting thing again is to notice the micro rotations. Okay. This can be actually explained by observing the particle that are rotating inside of inside the shear bank that and then the rotations is actually is not that active outside the shear bank. So in this simulation we can see that the shear bank, the formation of the shear bank in at least in the dense ensemble, we see a consistent pattern where we, we, we observe a significant rotations. And this uh, discovery can be further verified by the uh, micro X-ray CT or on any digital image correlation that can allow us to not only recover the displacement of individual particle, but a strength field, or in some sense, a high order strength field. Okay, so now I just want to point out the last fact because we introduced the water even though purposely the water effect for these problem should be minimum, we can still see the weight dependency introduced by the profilet because the water is redistributing. If you if you actually apply the loading weight really fast, okay, so you see here, if I apply the loading weight, the faster I load the loading weight, the more peak I would actually generate. And if I load it extremely small, then the pole pressure should be just zero all the way. But even that, when you actually trigger the movement at the beginning, is actually you, you can see that there are actually some non-zero effect. But what you can actually see is that the way the, the water redistribution doesn't affect the rotation to, that much, regardless of the way. Okay. So, um, and I want to actually complete these sections by, um, also talking a little bit about the material classifications. So uh, I think I have mentioned that before in other setting, but in, in general, one of the problem of writing the, or actually running the simulation is not so much on writing or using a constituted law. This is a great challenge, but a big challenge of the modeling, so at least from the modeling side, is the ability to actually identify a very robust set of material parameters that allow us to run the simulations. That goal for, for contained gear mechanics model, where our goal is to try to find the microscopic effective property or in the RE scale, or even indirectly try to use a sample to identify the grand particle uh, material response. The latter is particularly challenging because in reality, the particle the contact are actually not a homo homogeneous property, and but it's impossible to actually determine the individual uh, grain contact one by one. That would lead to a very large dimension problem. So uh, this is actually also one of the reasons using the DEM uh, for direct field prediction become very unrealistic, even though mathematically it's possible the curse of dimensions be making it very infeasible to actually generate a robust predictions. Okay, even though the constitutive law are correctly identified. Okay. Now here, what we actually want to do is actually compare two different ways of writing objective functions. So when you try to simulate, uh, when you try to identify the material parameter, it's actually sometimes we call it an inverse problem. In an inverse problem, what we are trying to do is that we may guess some material parameter like Young's modulus or Poisson ratios or whatever, or critical state line, to, okay, so uh, uh, additional parameter or whatever, okay. And we try to check whether that constituted with material parameter would actually generate a prediction that match our predictions, okay. And then we did two, and then what actually is ambiguous is that the way we write the objective functions will affect how predictive the model is, even though they are and they look approximately the same. So I determined, I just do a little bit experiment, uh, and part of it is for um, initiative process is that I try to actually replicate, I try to actually uh, generate a simulations. Okay, let's say shear stress string curve. And then I try to compare the 
the individual cone that I have experimental data, I try to compare the L2 norm of the discrepancy of the stress for given uh, for for the shear stress and also for the volumetric definitions. And here, my goal is to just to in the first problem case A, my goal is just to identify the optimum material parameter. Uh, in in this particular paper, the micropolar a material parameter that allow us to actually generate the best feeding stress strain curve. And in the second problem, we actually introduce a new term here that not only do we actually try to replicate the microscopic stress strain curve, we also try to actually matching the, the void ratio changing in the missile scale. Okay. So what actually happened is that we look at each pixels uh, that are available from the micro CT generated by our collaborator from France, uh, from the Grenoble group, uh, a former member of the Grenoble group, uh, Simon Salinger, and then he provided experimental data for us. And then we try to compare the void ratios that we that evolved in the 3D simulations with the experimental data. Okay, and then we actually changing it with the deep initial guess of the yield functions with all the material parameter, and then we keep improving the predictions with our optimization, optimization algorithm that intends to actually fit the curve. Okay, the red is actually the experimental curve. And you can see that in this case, um, that, that the case A actually matching the curve much better. Eventually the calibration case have the softening and then, and then, uh, have the, the reason that you don't see the cal curve completely overlap is because the, this is actually calibrated on a heterogeneous domain. This is actually making me much harder. But you can see the overall train is actually much, is actually quite good. But in the B case, you can see that, um, while wow, wow, initial gas is actually quite good, it actually lead to a response that doesn't, that apparently doesn't look, make much sense. It's way off, okay? So initially what we thought is that the case A is probably generated better predictions. But what we actually find is here, if we simulate the case A, what we would get is that we would get a shear bank that a single dom that a one single shear bank that are an isotropic mode. And if we try to simulate the case B, we would get for the that we would using the loose functions or the objective function in case B that also uh, try to incorporate a micro CD image. The the stress ring the shear bank is actually symmetric. Okay. So what actually happened is that this is the benchmark result from the image. You can actually see that the actual shear bank, if, I think this is actually not so clear because it's a particle movement. The actual shear bank is actually symmetric. Okay. So what does it tell you is that if you use the calibration A to do four predictions, it would be actually much worse than B. The reason is the following, the case A simulation at this point would actually rotate the principal axis of the string and introduce an isotropy that are very different than the case B and the experiment. Okay, so that tells you the difficulty of the calibrations and then the difference between the calibrations and use and the four predictions. What we see here is that you can see the additional constraint on the one hand actually uh, period changing the optimization problem to a constraint optimization problem or multi-objective optimization problem and hence the stress strain curve doesn't match as good. But on the other hand, this new objective gives us a more robust predictions by actually preserving the symmetry of the predictions. So uh, before I go further, I would like to take a small break here and then we will continue in 10 minutes.